Good evening, good evening, good evening, and welcome to a Facebook Live here on BlackDoctor.org. I am Ellis Dean, the Director of Digital Programming and Production here at Black Doctor, and we are, I'm excited to bring this show to you tonight, because, you know, a lot of times we have, we pre-plan these shows, or we have them planned weeks in advance, mm -hmm. but this show is really driven by what's happening in the community, what's happening in the world, and so uh, we're always trying to keep our fingers on a pulse of what's happening in health and wellness uh, so we can kind of give you the facts and, and let you know what's going on. And there's been a trend that's been happening recently that we wanted to kind of pull together some great experts to talk about, to give you the facts, to really kind of myths versus facts and tell you what's healthy and, and what could possibly something you might want to think twice about before you start doing so before we jump in and introduce all of our experts, there's a couple of things I want you to do for me this evening. Number one, let us know where you're watching from. We'd like to know where people are watching us, watching us from all over the world. So please drop that in the comment section. We'd like to know that. Number two, tag a friend. If you've got somebody you know that needs this information, tag them, share this on his page, on their page. So because you know we filter through all the BS out there and on the internet, and we'll give you the culturally competent information that you can use. So tag a friend, share this on your page so they can get the real deal. And then finally, if you have any questions, and I really encourage people to ask questions tonight because we want to get your questions answered, drop those in the comment section as well because we want to get those asked and answered so you can be better equipped to make a informed decision about what you want to do about your weight loss journey. So I've got a crack panel of experts here for you this evening. Uh, many of you faces that, that you recognize, you've seen before, uh, and uh, they're back. So let's get started. Number one, we have Dr. Lenore Coleman. She is uh, our, our pharmacist, our favorite pharmacist here on blackdoctor.org. She is also uh, the founder of Healing Our Village, and she is a diabetes expert. So she's going to tell you about all of the medications, what they do, how they work, uh, and, and what happens in the body when you start taking it. And so, and I think she's got a little, she's got personal experience with some of these medications as well. So she can talk to you from the medical side, from the pharmacist side, as well as from personal experience. So Dr. Coleman, welcome. Thank you very much. Oh. Hi. <laughs> Also, we have Dr. Eric Griggs, and you've seen him uh, every other Tuesday or so on Get Check, Get Fit, Get Moving. That is our show all about men's health. And we know that uh, Dr. Eric Griggs, he is a man about town. He is a media personality there in Louisiana. You can't throw a stone know who Dr. Griggs is or hasn't seen him on television. So uh, we have to have Dr. Griggs because he brings the real, real to you this evening. We're going to talk to a little bit to some of those brothers out there. Uh, you know, body shameless women to, and, and putting them, you know, so we're going to talk about that too. That, that's some stuff we're going to talk about with brothers. Welcome, Dr. Griggs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then finally, we have a face that is slowly becoming familiar, familiar here on blackdoctor.org, and you're going to see her more regularly because she's got a new program starting this Friday. Uh, you can catch her at 1 p.m. Eastern time, and it's called Embrace You, Hot Topics in Weight Loss. And so we're going to be talking about all the hot topics in weight loss. She is a board-certified bariatrician, and she's also a very, very warm and very kind person and, and very knowledgeable. I tell you, she writes so many articles. She puts out a lot of <laughs> Right, books. She got books. She got all this stuff. She got a lot of information that she's going to bring to us, uh, not only tonight, but on her program. So we had to have. She's like, you got too much information. We got to do. We got to get you a show. And so now she's got a great show here. And so check her out this Friday at one o'clock. Set the timer on, on your Facebook. Uh, but welcome, uh, Dr. Sylvia. Hello, happy Black History Month, y'all. Happy to be here. <laughs> I tried to step in first. So Disney Plus just started. Uh, streaming Wakanda forever, so... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Get that kicked off. I feel like I'm left out. Okay, I'm going to put my glasses on. Too. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot. We got to go around the room. All right. So starting with you, Dr. Coleman, yes. what are those medications? Uh, and, and a lot of them are used for diabetes. There's some that are not implicated, just or they're saying they're only for weight loss. But what are those medications that were initially designed for diabetics to control their A1C, as well as help them lose weight. What are those medications and what are they kind of, how do they work in the body? 
All right. So uh, um, there are, I just want to kind of just preface this so that you, people understand that there are um, a lot of drugs that are used for the management of your blood sugar. All right. Um, way back in the day, we had the insulins and the, the sulfonylureas, but they actually increased your insulin levels in your body. And that's how they controlled your blood sugar. But those drugs actually made you gain weight. So there are, for at least for the type two patients, we're not really wanting them to use drugs that help them gain weight because we found that it's actually the weight and high circulating levels of insulin, which keeps the weight on you, that is actually detrimental to controlling your blood sugar. So the whole idea is we want to decrease your insulin levels in your body so that you don't um, store fat. Because that's what insulin, the molecule that comes from your, from your pancreas, that's its job. Its job is makes your body to, to, to gain weight and store fat. All right, so we don't want that. So over the years, and I've been at this for about 40 years, so I, way back in the day, I, you know, when I first started doing diabetes education, all we had was first generation uh, sulfonylureas and animal insulin, beef and pork insulin. So we've come a long way, baby, <laughs> in the last four years, 40 years, in terms of the number of amazing treatments that we have. And one of the class of medicines that I happen to, to like the best, they're my personal favorites, is called the GLP-1 um, Incretin agonist. So they are gut, gut drugs that work in the level of the gut. And in your gut, you have two, two things. You have GLP-1, which is glucagon-like peptide 1, and then you have GIP. So both of these are gut hormones, and they're, they work in the gut. And what they basically do is deal with um, your how fast you empty your stomach, which is called gastric emptying. So in people who have diabetes, especially type 2 diabetes, what we see is that they have, de they have um, de delayed gastric emptying, right? Or they have sort of dumping. So you, you eat your food, it gets into your stomach, and then your stomach dumps that food into your bloodstream after it's, after it's metabolized it. And of course, if you dump all that food into your bloodstream, your blood sugars go up. So we don't want that. We want to delay how fast that happens. And these drugs that are on the market, the GLP-1, and they come as injections, most of them. There are several drugs in that class. But the, uh, there is one, which is the newest one out there, um, uh, semaglutide. Simba, it comes as a pill and an injection. And that drug actually now has a new FDA indication that it can be used for weight loss. There is also luraglutide, all of these end with tide. So in the, <laughs> pharmacy, in the pharmacy industry, you can kind of figure out classes of drugs because of the ending of that drug. All right, so you got sem semaglutide, you got luraglutide, you have exenatide, they all end in tide. And these drugs, a couple of them have actually at larger doses than you use for the management of diabetes at larger doses, these drugs actually help you lose weight. And the main way they do that is by, again, slowing down that gastric emptying. They also have an effect on something called glucagon, which comes from the liver. And we know in the body, when glucagon goes up, insulin, goes, insulin levels go down. And when insulin levels go up, glucagon levels go down. So these drugs actually affect glucagon levels. And so they make the glucagon go up so that your insulin levels go down. Now, remember what I said at the beginning, we're trying to get those insulin levels down because people with type two diabetes have what they call hyperinsulinemia, which makes sense. It's a word that kind of makes sense, hyperinsulin. So it means it's high circulating levels of insulin. And, and that's bad. We don't want that. Not only does it make you hold on to the fat and it's harder to lose weight, but it can have all sorts of damaging effects on various um, parts of the body, uh, your, your, your circulatory system, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the newest one, the semaglutide, got the FDA approval. It's called, uh, the brand name is Wigozi. 
and it injected weekly, which is kind of neat. Some of the other ones in the class you have to do daily. And the very first one you actually had to do sometimes twice a day. So now we're moving to these agents can only can be injected once a week. And the, the, the reason why they really also help with weight loss is they affect the brain. They affect the center of the, in the brain and the hypothalamus that makes you think you want to eat. Now, one of, one of the things about people with type 2 diabetes is that 80% of them are overweight, 80%. So that means that most type 2 diabetic patients are always trying to think about what they want to eat. And there's very, very few times where they're not, they forget to eat, okay? <laughs> Having been a person who has struggled with my weight my entire life, I understand that. So these agents actually work in the satiety center of your brain, and it basically makes you just not hungry. And I know it's a fact because I I actually use one of those agents as well, um, just on a, on a, a, a sporadic basis because it it helps me just main, get keep my insulin levels down, and that's why I'm using it. And so I me I measure my blood sugar, I, and I use the drug based upon what my blood sugar levels are. So that's sort of quick and dirty, um, what, what the, that, that class of agents does, and, and we're pretty excited about them. Well, I, look, I was about to start shouting. You really just gave us a, a whole word right there. I mean, we go past the plate on that one, Dr. Coleman. So, so Dr. Sylvia, you hear that? I saw your head shaking, even though it was just, I saw your head shaking. So when you, when you hear all of that as a bariatrician, what does that sound to you? How do you hear that? You know, because it's something we always have our filters and we hear what's important to us. So what when you heard all of that, what's important to you when you're working with somebody that's trying to lose weight? Well, first, I want to just salute Dr. Coleman for her 40 years in the field and her incredible wealth of knowledge, right? It's Black History Month and we have living history on the stage. So that's where I want to start um, even with that. And I think what peaks to me is a couple of things, right? Because one of the things when we talk about weight, especially for Black people, is we really need to contextualize it, not just about calories in versus calories out, but also about all the different factors that go into how we define what we call healthy weight for Black people. And also, I like today, I specifically wore this shirt, which is from the T Black History Month collection. It's from an artist, um, Chiba Uliwa, Ilinwa, and it says, all shapes all sizes, beautiful, right? Beautiful in all shapes, all shades. And so I think it's really important that we remember that we're not talking about the cosmetics and the aesthetics here. We are really, because everyone's beautiful, like whatever shape, whatever size you're in, but we're talking about figuring out what's a healthy level of body fat for you so that you're not getting the hyperinsulinemia that she talked about and you're not at risk for diabetes, that you're not, this is also heart month, you're not at risk for heart disease and all the other things as well. So I think um, that's what peeks out to me is just remembering that body fat is a useful organ in the body. But when we're talking about the disease of obesity, you've exceeded your body's necessary threshold for body fat. And so at that point, we need to help you figure out how how to get it down to a helpful level, a healthy level. And these new medications are just one of the many tools that can help you do it. But there's a lot of other things that we need to do as well. And I'll land there. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, I think uh, I'm, I'm going to come right back to you, uh, Dr. Sylvia, because I, I think you always make a good point about, and I think our audience needs to hear this, about calling obesity a disease. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not mm -hmm. a lifestyle choice. And so and 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 I kind of made up my own little phrase that says oh, obesity is a diagnosis, not a description. And so yes, really that. help people understand that it's just like cancer. It's just like hypertension. Obesity is a disease. And we have to approach it with that mindset of overcoming a disease. 
Yeah, and that's a tough thing, right? Because when we talk about like bias out there and not just racial bias, but there's also weight bias because for many years, even in the healthcare community, obesity wasn't considered a disease. Most people don't realize it wasn't until 2013, y'all. So we're just coming up on the 10 year anniversary of obesity being classified as a disease. And when we say that, what that means is not a lifestyle choice, that there's actually complex neuroendocrine bias Biology. She talked about the incretins. We talked about insulin. We can talk about cortisol. Like there's a complex chemistry going on in the body that is favoring your body to continue storing fat when it's gone past a healthy threshold. And then that leads to inflammation. That leads to actual what we call fat mass disease, like things like fatty liver disease, pushing against your vital organs, pushing against the heart. So it, it really, there's actually over 200 diseases associated with obesity. Obesity. So that's why it is such a critical thing for us to talk about, um, especially now and especially with these medications and these medicines being diverted. The other thing I want to say why it's important to think about it as a disease, because a lot of times there can be a lot of shame around taking a medication. It's a two-edged sword, right? There's people um, who are like grabbing, like, give me whatever you got, doc, and let me take it real quick and <laughs> slip up. Mm -hmm. And then there's people who are like, oh my gosh, I'm a failure. I can't believe I can't lose this weight on my own. I need to get in that boot camp. I need to do all that. And they forget that, hey, I, what I like to tell people, imagine you were at you, if somebody was about to run a race, you know, you're at a track meet, right? And some, you're at the starting line, one player, like one runner's missing and they come up huffing and puffing. They're like, <gasps> and wheezing. You hear them, you know, they have asthma. They're huffing and puffing. Would you tell that person with asthma, like wheezing to go ahead and run the race? Would you be like, just get in there, toughen up, you know, just get be stronger, get in there, run that race. Would we do that? We would never do that, but that's what we do with people with obesity. They are saying, hey, doc, I am exercising, I'm eating well, I cannot burn off this extra fat because I have this hyperinsulinemia working against me, I have this hypercortisol working against me. And we're saying, no, just work harder, push through it, keep going. So the medicines are mm -hmm. not giving people an unfair playing advantage. All it's doing is bringing them to the starting line so that they run the same race as everybody else, because having obesity, having any metabolic condition is putting you behind the starting line and all the medicines are doing bring you up. So I want to release people of that shame because I think mm -hmm. there's, it, it's very complex. One, the medicines were not included in the trials, right? As black people. So that's the place to start, but then we're not in, and there's a fear of trials. There's a fear of medicine, which is historic as well. And then it's not priced. It's not accessible for a lot of us and the people who need it the most, but then right. There's the shame that we put on ourselves by feeling like, oh, I'm a failure if I have to take a medicine. And this is real talk that I have to do with a lot of my clients and patients. Like your medicine is a tool that's bringing you to the starting line. So you run the same race as everyone else. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, uh, everybody look to your neighbor and say, let go of the shame. Look to your neighbor to your left. <laughs> say, let go of the shame. OK, that's how we're going to do. We're going to do it like church today. OK, <laughs> let go of the shame. So Dr. Griggs. It, you got to come behind them too. So I got. <laughs> Man, I wish I could have them too in my pocket all the time. <laughs> so, so when what's you're, interesting? When you're... Go ahead. No, go ahead. What were you about to ask? I, I want to follow your question. No, I, want, I, want, I want to hear your thoughts. I want to hear your thoughts. Definitely. So, first of all, there's two things. Uh, this is amazing. This is a beautiful screen. It is Black History Month. Um, as Dr. Sylvia reminded us, and she's got the shirt. Uh, Dr. Lenore, I mean, again, you're, you're right with hats off. Um, there's a wealth of knowledge uh, that lies in our community uh, and, 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 and on this screen. Um, you know, the, the, I think I told you years ago, uh, being former athletes, uh, I decided once you stop playing sports, uh, mm -hmm. you start to get more sedentary, uh, you start to accumulate. <laughs> fat uh, in places that you never had before. Your eight pack goes to a six pack, goes to a party ball. Okay. You know, I'm at a keg, man. No shame, no shame. Yeah, I'm at a keg, dad right, right. But What happens is a lot of times we'll take that shame and we will, in, 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 our, in our, our defense mechanism, we'll turn it into a positive. 
uh, I live in New Orleans. And during the pandemic, uh, my stress level went up and I ran and I got down almost to my high school weight. Now, if you want to offend someone, ask them to get down to their high school weight. How many times have you heard? Oh, yeah, I can I can lose some weight, but I don't want to. That's too small. I don't, I don't know. That's that's a little too small for me. I don't want to be that size anymore. When right. metabolically, that's actually your ideal size. And it I do want to hear the other uh, panelists' opinion on the whole this whole BMI thing. Um, I live in the lane, Ellis, as you know, as a com uh, community medicine doctor, I live in the lane of health literacy. Um, and I do want to pay attention to the fact that, you know, one of the most useful and unused tools in our communities is our pharmacist, Dr. Lenore, mm -hmm. our pharmacist. You know that line? We always use that window to skip the line when you're trying to buy in front of everybody else. Can I? And it's called, called pharmacy consultation for a reason. Uh, as 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 doctors, we go through as MDs, we go through school and we'll have a class, have a pharmacology class. Some of us struggle, to get out of it. And some of us struggle to get out of it again, and we get out of it, and we're good, <laughs> and we learn what we need to learn. <laughs> the average pharmacist spends at least at a minimum of six years uh, learning about pharmacology and the drugs and how they affect your body. So Dr. Leno, hats off, and I really want to encourage people to use both of the specialties seen on here. I want the pharmacist, pharmacist in the pharmacy window, a bariatric specialist. Um, obesity is a disease for 10 years. Uh, it, people were using it as a description of themselves as opposed to a description of a tissue that's in our body. Our, our body. Uh, diets go to Die. Fat is not a description of a person. It's what she's holding in her hand. And that's the five pounder, right? <laughs> it's what she's holding in her hand. That's five pounds of fat. If you lose that five pounds, you should be proud of yourself. You should absolutely yeah. be proud of yourself. It's like holding a, a, a newborn baby and you lose the equivalent of five pounds. But the, the, my point is using the re, uh, resources in our community, finally making it public that we're recognizing obesity as a disease. I can remember my during my third and fourth year uh trainings, uh, periactin. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm aging myself. This is the mid-90s. Periactin, which is an anti antihistamine that would cut your appetite. People would come to clinic, request it. I'll oh, give me my periactive. I need my periactive. Instead of getting active, give me my periactins so I can lose weight. And immediately when they would stop, the weight would come back. The same trends happen because of evolutionary design. Our bodies tend to think that we're going through a famine or a crisis. We can talk about that a little later. If you lose weight really quickly, your body thinks something's wrong and it's like, hold on, wait, we're going to save her. We're going to save her from herself. We're going to reset her set point and add some weight just because if we're going to be going through these cycles, look, we, we, we need to get through this. So the point is making it a, a conversation instead of a, in a discussion, instead of an observation is amazing. So I don't want people, we, we can talk about the supply issues right now, with these new drugs um, and people trying to <laughs> bypass the system. And with that, I'll, I'll right. stop because I, I know that's an issue. So Dr. Coleman, real quick, there was a question and I want to get, like I said, I want to, I want to answer people's questions. There was a question in the um, comments and it says, if you have tingling your toes, uh, is that a sign of diabetes? Yeah. So, yeah, let's talk a little just real quick about the signs of, of diabetes. So the classic signs are um, what they call the three P's, which is polyuria, polydipsia and polyphagia. So polyuria is getting up and, and going to the restroom a lot and you didn't necessarily drink enough water to make that make sense to you, especially at night. So if you're getting up in the middle of the night having, and, and having to go to the restroom, you know, you may, your blood sugars may be up. So polyphagia is, is all of a sudden you get super hungry and you just can't get enough. Now, that is a symptom that really is, is, is toward the end of your blood sugars being really, really, really high. All right. Mm -hmm. And then the polydipsia means you're super thirsty all the time. But then there are these these signs that people don't think about. So the numbness and tingling in your hands and your feet, very common sign of diabetes. All of a sudden you're going to the dentist and you're getting a whole bunch of cavities. For, and you don't remember getting all those cavities before. Women, very common sign, vaginal infections. You're going and getting to the pharmacy, getting those over the counter uh, can candida creams in order to, because you have a, a, a manilial infection. All of those are more subtle signs that your blood sugar is up. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, yes, absolutely. Because diabetes, 
basically they say it, it 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 kills you one limb at a time one thing at a time so there are the 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 um the sort of big complications the macrovascular complications that's your heart attack and stroke but your your microvascular those are your nerves the nerves in your eyes the nerves in your hands the nerves in your kidneys the nerves in your feet all diabetes that high sugar affects those nerves and then it affects the the nerves and the blood vessels in the kidney and so 2023 for healing our village is the year of chronic kidney disease and i would really like to make it so that no more people who look like me all right are going to, to the dialysis center three and yeah. four times a week to get They're their blood to. cleared out wouldn't that be nice and i would like this year for us to not have high blood pressure wouldn't that be nice and yes. so these are all signs that we see with our people with diabetes and you put diabetes plus these other things like hypertension, um, then you really you really have a, a can have an issue. I just want to say two really quick things. Number one, these medications that I just mentioned, the GLP ones, we're talking about maybe a six and possibly a 10 percent reduction in your body weight. So let's let's talk about that. So if you weigh 300 pounds. Mm. That's 30 pounds. If you lose 10% of your body weight, all right? So 300 minus 30 is 270 pounds. Now, how much did you weigh in high school? Probably <laughs> 150 pounds. And so 270 pounds is a long way from 150 pounds. Okay? So these drugs, even though they are good and, they're, and they're, they do work, you know, as our, our bariatrician knows, this is a hard slog. Get, losing this weight is a complex thing that takes a lot of different things. And it's diet and exercise, um, controlling your stress. I mean, it's, it's complicated. And so I just don't want people to think that these drugs are a quick fix. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> That's all I can say. So Dr. Sylvia, you heard that. How? Let's talk about obesity in, in the Black community. How prevalent is it? And what are some of the biases that are common that black uh, people suffering with obesity are facing when they try to get treatment? Yeah, so at the great question, first of all, Ellis, so according to the CDC data, like most recently, 57% of black women classifies obesity as having obesity. And then when it comes to men, we can see up to 40%. Um, some studies have even greater um, for black men. So it is very prevalent where you're seeing almost two thirds of, of women in particular. So we have the black women have the highest rates. But Dr. Griggs actually brought up something very important is how do we classify obesity, right? So there is mm -hmm. a thing called the body mass index, right? Which um, many people, and I'm going to do a show on it when we talk about it, we've talked about it in the past, but many people don't realize that this calculation actually started back in 1832 in Belgian people. And the, even the standards of how we use the BMI, or what the tables that we use for it, were not based on Black people. So what we see now when we have newer data coming in, there's a lot of limits because when we talk about weight and when we talk about obesity, we're talking about what percentage of body fat, like how much body fat do you have that's putting you at risk for adverse disease, not just like what total body weight you're at. So the BMI does not actually distinguish against um, body fat. So it only looks at total body weight. So when it comes to, so there's, it has a lot of bias built into it when we're talking about age, when we're talking about um, biological sex or hormonal status. Um, also, when we talk, when we look at race in general as well, there's some great studies around that. And then also when we look at obesity related conditions, even diabetes, right? So there have been studies done, um, a great one from Dr. Fatima Cody Stanford, who's one of the leading, she was just on 60 Minutes and she's actually a black woman based out of Harvard. Her and her group, they actually proposed an adjusted BMI chart. Um, they looked at if we were to adjust for certain factors being race, ethnicity, so being non-Hispanic, also looking at obesity-related conditions, hyper 
hyperlipidemia, so high cholesterol, hypertension, diabetes, and we adjusted for this in a biological sex. If we adjusted for it, would the BMI cutoff still be the same? And it was very interesting because what they found is for Black men, actually the cutoff for obesity was lower. So whereas normal, like BMI, we use a BMI of 30 um, for everyone saying that's why we diagnose or we screen for obesity to prompt further testing. What they found was that for Black men, it was at like 27 if they had hypertension or 28 if they had hyperlipidemia. And I have this on my blog. So if they people go to my blog, my website on my blog, I have so, it like repeated several times. It's in my book as well. But then they also, when we look for Black women, what was interesting, why I say the statistics have to be adjusted, right? They need to be rechecked and readjusted because for Black women, we know that studies show that we have more subcutaneous fat and there's different kinds of fats in your body, right? So the type of fat that tends to lead to disease is visceral fat. Is all that belly fat that Dr. Griggs is talking about? Is that keg, you know? But black women, hey, hey, we hey, tend to. <laughs> it's all right. We love you. beautiful, all shapes and sizes. That's what we say, right? All shapes, yeah. all shades, all sizes, no shade. So, um, so, but, but for women, we have more subcutaneous. So it's underneath the skin. And so when they looked at that, actually, for black women, we actually had high, a higher threshold before we were had, at risk for disease. So for instance, with diabetes, the curve actually shift to 33 as the cutoff for, for, um, for obesity in people with diabetes. And that correlates when we look at other factors of how you screen for obesity. So waist circumference is a good one too. So checking to just yep. putting a tape measure around the waist and screening for it, which is very underused because where you carry your fat matters where you carry it matters. So if it's mostly in the abdomen, that's putting you at high risk. Also like just something simple doing a body composition scale, right? So having a scale where you actually look at what percentage of body fat in. And then of course, if you have diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, all these diseases, then your threshold's a little bit different. Those need to be controlled regardless of what size you're in. So I think when we look at these statistics, it's important to keep in mind, number one, that they probably are going to be changing soon as we get more tailored and customized on our definition of obesity. And number two, that regardless of what these statistics say, because they can be very discouraging. And I write a lot about this. I, one of the, my signature talks that I talk about is like, obesity and Black women, what are we missing? And I make the point that Black women want to be healthy. Black men want to be healthy. I think when we get caught up on the statistics, it's almost like people get tunnel vision, right? Like, oh, Black people have the highest rate of obesity. All right, but what are we doing to move past this? So I think really looking past the statistics and looking to yourself for a solution, because regardless of where you are on that spectrum, if you have these lifestyle factors where you're not sleeping, Sleeping well, you're not eating foods that reduce inflammation, that heal your body, that fuel your body and nourish it. You're not moving your body daily or regularly getting that exercise, and you're not um, control dealing with the psychological trauma, like all of these things. There's over a hundred factors outside of medication, like outside of the biology that actually impact your weight. So I think it's important that we also do that individual introspection to see what you can fix and what you can change. Absolutely. So if you're just joining us, we are talking to the super friends with regards to the, the diabetes drugs that people are taking to lose weight, what's real, what's not, what's happening. And so we've got a, a wonderful panel here talking about that. You brought up a, a, a good point, Dr. Sylvia, and I'm going to throw this to you, Dr. Griggs, because your last program was about sleep and the importance of sleep. So talk to the audience and understand is if you're on this weight loss journey, if you're trying to lose weight, how important is sleep in that puzzle, that weight loss puzzle that you're putting together? How important is sleep? And I know a lot of times we wear lack of sleep as a badge of courage. Oh, I only got three hours of sleep last night and I'm getting, I'm, I'm going hard. And I don't know, maybe that's the way our employers, all of us that are you know, tied to employers, they, they, 
send that messaging to us that yeah, working hard and, and, and sleeping less is somehow a badge of courage and it's really impacting our health. So talk about sleep and the importance of it when we're trying to lose weight. Yeah, so that's an excellent uh, question. The, the thing is, you know, <laughs> uh, sleep is essential. Um, I say that we are our, our, our smartest at the extremes of age, uh, under the age of nine or 10, and over the age of about 60. Uh, we know the importance of eating well. We know it upsets our stomach. I'm not going to eat that because it doesn't make my stomach feel good. Um, <laughs> right. We know the importance of spending time with friends and playing. Uh, we care less about what people think. Anybody that's seen a two-year-old walking around with a diaper? Yeah. With that, that two-year-old strut and just a pamper, we know. And we've seen that in 70-year-old grandfathers, too. 75-year-old grandfathers, the same strut. <laughs> I think about Fred Sanford. Most importantly, we know the importance of sleep. When you think of kids, after they've gotten in their playtime to de-stress, all of us as kids, we couldn't wait to go outside and play. Uh, no matter how, whether you're in gifted class, whether you're in preschool, it didn't matter. Once you got your work done, your reward was to treat yourself and not think about it. You can't think about a math problem when you're playing dodgeball. You might get hit in the face. Or when you're walking in the woods with your friends. So equally important was nap time. Uh, as mm -hmm. we get older, um, we tend to appreciate more and more the importance of naps. Uh, now, we don't know how to nap or when to nap because we'll have nine cups of coffee um, and it'll disrupt our sleep cycle. And the sleep deficit isn't one to one for every hour that you lose in sleep. It could take days uh, to, to make up for it. So sleep, what happens is as you shorten the time for your body to get into REM sleep or stage four sleep, your body's not able to have the growth hormones and the healing processes to take place, which means that your stress hormones, cortisol and epinephrine, they stick around. You're staying up and you're going through the stresses of A, being up past the time that you're supposed to metabolize food. The normal, uh, one of the main enzymes that processes our food that, that we take in is PFK1. Uh, and once that turns off, because it's tied to your pineal gland, uh, uh, HMG-CoA reductase comes in. That sounds like a big old name, Dr. Coleman, Dr. Lenore, you, you know what it is. It's exactly where your, your statins work. Uh, cholesterol is stored fat in the blood. If you want to think of it in simple terms, I live in the lane of health literacy. And Ellis has a great, does a great job of asking the doctors the hard questions that you should ask your doctor. And if my grandmother having a sister that was 14 years younger than I was in med school, she said, if I couldn't explain it to an eight-year-old, I must not really know. Um, sleep is, is extremely important because those hormones hormones cause you to do things that aren't natural uh, nat natural for your body to survive in order to stress eating. You start looking for eating at night. Again, not only are you increasing your fat stores and your cholesterol, but you're eating things that are more processed foods typically, like those chips, the ice cream, and all those things that make you tired, that make you crazy. Stay at my house. Stay at my house, dog. Stay at my house. <laughs> man, hey, man, listen, I'm not shaming, man. I love your dad, bud. It's good. We good. We good. We're on the same page. You too, me too. This is this is a bonding experience. But the point is, you carry that stress with you throughout the day. It it, it, it changes your decision making, uh, makes you cranky. Uh, a lot of times we, we resort to our, our um, comfort foods that all work. We're, we start this vicious cycle of, 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 of working against us. There's if you've ever truly gone on vacation or truly had a break and, or your body just tells you to shut down and start with a 20 minute nap and it turns into six hours or you wake up the next day, how refreshed you feel and you feel what normal is like, um, you'll understand what it is that I mean. But one of the most important parts about it is there's a lot of guilt that goes along with it. And one of the things that I had to tell people during the pandemic and I tell people when they're dealing with weight issues is the first thing that you should do in the morning when you go to brush your teeth, you wash your face, you look in the mirror and forgive yourself. Hey, it's mm. okay. Uh, Dr. Sylvia, you know, you're, 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 you tell yourself you're beautiful and whatever mistakes I made, it's okay. Uh, because mm -hmm. it took, it took over 50 years to get this fine. Now I need to get back to high school fine. So I, 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 I want to have at least 50 years to do it. So you take it one step at a time and using the, all the tools in the toolbox, which would be these doctors that are here on this panel and the new drugs that come out under the guidance of it. There's no such thing as a bad question. There's no read to circumvent the system and, and un work with the new tools. You're talking about the super friends, the new tools and Batman's uh, Batman's belt or ba Batgirl's Batman and Batgirl in their belt 
to, to, to work with your diet and the experts to guide you along the way. So sleep is of the utmost, utmost important. And all of us are probably working on a sleep deficit. Probably. So Dr. Coleman, there's another question. And this is a question about medication. So I'm, I'm coming to you. Um, Stephanie is having some issues with her Ozempic. Are there any alternative medications that she can take? Uh, I don't know what the issues are. And I'm going to say before you answer that question, that this all of our responses for information purposes only. OK, and so please have this conversation with your doctor. So do not stop your medication while you're waiting to, to think about trying something new. Go have a conversation with your doctor. This is just information so you can have and, and have spur that conversation with your doctor. So this is not medical and, advice. And, and your pharmacist. And your pharmacist. And, and your pharmacist. pharmacist. Yes. That's a doctor, too. That, that's part of you. I know y'all skip. I know y'all skip. But this, yes. <laughs> Oh, yeah. So okay. So, so she's saying the pharmacies are totally out of uh, getting a you know, Zipic because people are, I guess, people are buying it on the market. So, uh, are there is there an alternative to a Zipic because you can't find a Zipic? So you all are very well aware that um, they're having these supply chain problems. Okay. Well, these supply chain problems yeah. has really hurt drug manufacturers. And so it's not just this drug. A lot of the medications that are out there especially ones like this class of GLP-1s uh, injections, They're, these injectables are, 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 are uh, in shorter supply than they were pre-COVID and pre-Ukraine, all right? That's why you hear all the stuff on the news about they're trying to bring drug manufacturing back to a place like Puerto Rico. I don't know if anybody's been to Puerto Rico, but Puerto, if, if you go there, even now, you'll see empty drug manufacturing plants because that's where all of the drugs for the U.S. used to be made in Puerto Rico. Now everything's being made in China. Mm. And that, and I didn't know it had gotten to that extent, but we're, they're talking about 80, 90% of medications that we're getting here in the United States are being being manufactured in China. So that that's a huge problem. Um, the class of medications that we're talking about that where uh, um, Ozempic is one of those agents is that GLP-1. So if you were just to go to Google and just, you know, write in uh, what what drugs are, are GLP-1 agonists, just write that that uh, that sentence. It'll give you about six different drugs that are in that class. Now, when you're saying that you're having a hard time getting them, I don't know what that means exactly, but I know for the management of diabetes, unfortunately, they still are um, wanting you to kind of use metformin first and, and, then, and then, you, then use the other ones. And sometimes the GLP ones are not on your doctor's radar screen. But what the doctors need to know is recently, like, I mean, last year, the algorithm for the management of diabetes changed. And so now we're not doing this start with diet and exercise, then you go to metformin, then you then you can try these other agents, all right, based upon if they're on the formulary of your insurance company, which is another whole show that we, can, <laughs> we have to talk about. Okay, so anyway, so now some of the newer agents, so there are the, the, the DPP-4s, right? Those are the, those are the citagliptins, right? They end in glyptin, that class. You got your GLP-1s and you got your SGLT-2. So those drugs are also used for the management of diabetes. They, both the DPP-4s and the SGLT-2s don't have a lot of effect on weight loss, but they are excellent for the management of diabetes and the GLP, the SGLT2s, if you have kidney disease, there's certain ones that they want you to use first, right out of the, right off the bat. And if you have um, heart disease, especially heart failure, they're wanting you to use a different drug that has a lot of good data on its management of pa diabetes patients with heart failure. So the way we manage diabetes has changed drastically from what it was over the last 10, 20 years that I've, I've, been, uh, I've been at this and I've actually been at it for 40. So I'm excited that now the algorithms that doctors are using has really changed. Um, to, to, to just as, again, a short answer to your question, there are a number of drugs in that class, all are prescription, 
all will require uh, 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 something from your doctor. And they may or may not be available in your pharmacy, just depending upon what part of the country you live in and supply chain issues. And Dr. Coleman, can you talk a little bit about Manjura or Terzetapide as well? Because that's the newest one and that's going to be a game changer that has about 15 to 20% weight loss that they're seeing. And Lily is what the big pharmacy company is looking to have it approved for weight loss next year. So that's a good one to keep on their radar. Dar, can yes. you talk a little bit about it? Yeah, that's the newest one. Um, that's the one as, as a person who specializes in diabetes, that's the one I'm most excited about. Um, again, that would be on the top tier of your, of your insurance plan. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's going to be hard to get that drug, at least for a while, but its weight loss ability is pretty exciting. So it's starting at 10 and going up to 15, 18% reduction in body weight. It's also a weekly uh, medication. Um, and so it, it, I, we're pretty excited about this drug for because it's in that class that I like, that GLP-1 agonist class, but it also seems to have a significant ability to, to decrease weight because weight is the issue. Um, I just wanted to throw out a couple more tidbits because I, you know, as I said, I'm really, I'm, I'm now, this is my, this is my three score and 10 years. So I am 70 years She old. pulling rank, y'all. She said, look, I earned this. I get to talk like, we fall right. back. Go ahead, Ma. You got right. it. <laughs> okay. It's, be, it's bad when they come start calling you auntie. Then you know you're actually going to get right? She but is it's pulling <laughs> rank. Go for it, Dr. Coleman. You go got sis. it. You got it. You got it. As, as a senior, I just want to let my seniors out out there knowing I'm in that category <laughs> that my my New Year's resolution was to go out and start lifting weights mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I'd like to have you kind of talk a little bit about the fact that that is that muscle at, during the night when you're sleeping and hopefully you're getting six to eight hours of sleep that's burning that's burning those calories and as a senior, as we get older, we lose our muscle mass. Mm -hmm. So now I'm struggling harder to lose or keep my weight down. And it occurred to me the reason why that is, is because I, I had way more muscle when I was in my 30s, 40s, 50s than I have now. So that's my goal for 2023. And these medicines are causing muscle loss. So one of the key things I tell all my patients and clients is to make sure you have that resistance program in place so that you're losing fat and not your muscle mass. That's a big thing that we just talked about our recent obesity conference, like how can we preserve? And that's one of the reasons why you're getting that weight regain because the loss of muscle is going to slow your metabolism, your basal metabolic rate and your body's natural ability to burn fat. So it's so important that we continue doing the things that build muscle mass. And I know there's some questions in here about herbal. I don't want I don't want them to come out and be biased. You know, the herbalists get serious. So let's let's yes, go there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it's got to ask twice. Just, I'm, I'm get, just sure. Go ahead. Real quick, I want people to remember that some of the biggest muscles in the body. Um, I just had to do a, a panel earlier today to seniors um, about exercise. The biggest muscles in your body are between your armpits and your knees. Uh, and it doesn't, you don't need a gym membership to do it. Uh, the resistance band, you can go to the, what is it, five below and get a resistance band and do stretches. Um, you can sit down, seated squats. You're working those big muscles, your, those glutes and the quads and the hams and your legs that can, the more exercise you get of those muscles, the more calories you're burning while you're asleep. It doesn't have to be hard. This is nothing. Look, again, it took all these years. You did a lot of work to get this fine. You can do a lot of work to get back to that <laughs> One step, at a time. one step at a time absolutely and i just want to point out that i put uh if you first of all y'all know dr Cole was amazing okay three three score in 10 years and and have that kind of energy and have to still have that be, be that sharp it's fantastic and she has some wonderful energy. And so i put her website step 90.com in the chat I promise you, if you are diabetic, and I know there's a couple of people that have, have said that they are diabetic, if you're diabetic, go to that website, please. And let Dr. Coleman, she's got a wonderful program there that will help control your A1C, help you control your A1C, get that weight down, control your diabetes. Go to stepup90.com for Dr. Coleman. And, and 
If you want to do overall weight loss, go to embrace you, <laughs> embrace you weight loss.com as well for Dr. Sylvia. So you can get them after this program is over. We're going to do another one because we got to do another one. It's just, it's just fantastic. <laughs> but that's just for, for after the show. Um, so, yes. So the question has been asked about herbal alternatives. Are there any herbal alternatives that people can use um, and not this, just that are just getting you know, made legal in certain states. I don't know if we talk about those kind of herbal alternatives. We're just gonna talk about herbal <laughs> alternatives. <laughs> I don't think this is. <laughs> I don't think that's what they talk about. I just want to make some clarification, but some herbal alternatives that could help people either control their their A1C. And we need to talk about why is A1C versus blood sugar. What are those two things? We'll talk about that too, because I think people need to understand that there's a difference and A1C is a better kind of reading, but control their A1C or uh, lose weight. Are there any herbal alternatives versus kind of uh, pharma medication? Is that for Not me? Everybody jump in. <laughs> I was going to let Dr. Coleman start. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. uh, you can start and then I'll be happy Definitely. to chime in. There are a couple that I commonly hear on these streets that people are talking about. People come in to it, Berba Green being the most common, right? right? And I would just start with and then cinnamon, black garlic. And again, the thing about herbs, let's remember herbs are medications, okay? Because I think there is this misconception that, oh, it's herbal, it's natural, I can just take it any kind of way, but you need to be under the care of someone who knows what they're doing with it. And usually it's going to be a naturopathic doctor or an ND. They undergo extensive training in herb, uh, herbs. And you also need to make sure that you're telling your doctor, you're telling your pharmacist that what medi herbs you are taking. They are not benign. They actually, meaning that they're not harmless. They can interact with some of the medications we're taking. One of the fear complications when it comes to diabetes is hypoglycemia or low blood sugars. They can kill you. So that can kill you. It can. You can have seen people have seizures because of that. I've seen people go into coma. So you really need to make sure that you're telling them what herbs you're taking and talk about it. And so she said like time, like, or like, etc. Herbs. She's like herbs, like, you know, herbs. And so, so she, that's what she needs. So garlic, black garlic, probably is the number one one. Cinnamon. Cinnamon also helps. I use it regular because it helps to cut the amount of sugar that you need in it. I use salon cinnamon is one that I commonly put in my, which is um, a more a refined kind that comes from um, East, Southeast Asia. And it actually has been shown to help to stabilize your body's insulin levels. So that is some like a simple um, spice. It's technically a spice, not an herb, but that you can use and add to it. And Dr. Coleman, I'll let you take it away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so the data out there, basically, let's talk about herbs. Mm -hmm. um, when you, when there's very good data, there's not very good data that they could cause any significant amount of weight loss. The interesting thing about um, sort of the, the holistic herbal approach to, to, uh, to health is that people lose weight when they start using those things, but guess what else they start doing? They also start drinking their smoothies and they also start eating more fruits and vegetables and they also start getting out there and walking. And so, but when you go to the clinical trial where you're controlling for those other things, the data does not show that, that herbs actually can, can de decrease your weight. Now, there is a, there is a, a chromium picolinate and there's good data out there that chromium does along with some exercise does show some reduction in weight. Um, and so if I, if I have to pick some one thing that I'm going to pick for weight loss, that would be the, the one that I did. But let me tell you what I just did. So I just went to my vitamin store. I don't want to tell what store. And uh, cause I don't want to give any branding around here. And uh, I just went to my vitamin store and I looked at the label and I picked up a, a super powerful multivitamin that had all the vitamins and all the minerals and biotin for your skin. I mean, it had everything. And it had some of that Burberry root and all of those, you know, herbals in there as well to help with sort of getting your metabolism kind of moving. And I am religiously, I just started this, taking this, because it also occurred to me that when you're talking about metabolism, and that's my problem. My problem is, is that 
uh, the reason why I am 20 pounds higher than I've ever been is because my metabolism is just shot. And so right. I have to do everything that I can to boost my metabolism. And so your body is this amazing science machine <laughs> that has all of these things that it needs to work efficiently. And those, and you just don't get enough fruits, vegetables, and, and sunshine and for you to be able to process the way you should process. So that's why I went and got that. And I, so I really recommend that everybody out there, especially your seniors, Get a good multiple vitamin that you take regularly. If, and now the pills are pretty big. And if you can't swallow <laughs> pills, then you come in liquid, right? You can get a liquid formulation, right? But I, I really, I really recommend that. But so that's what I'm thinking at this point in time. I love that, Dr. Cole. So since you brought up that, so that brings up two important vitamins, right? So vitamin D deficiency, very common in our population, Black people and in people who have extra fat tissue, because it's a vitamin that is carried in the fat, right? And not all vitamin D is created the same. There's D2 and there's vitamin D3. So knowing which type you're taking is better absorbed is important. And then people, look, should I even bring it up, Dr. Griggs? Should I bring it up, Dr. Coleman? These B12 shots. <laughs> Should I bring it up? Should I get rid of it? Bring it up. Go for it. Put, put up, just put out the disclaimer. Put out there. Put out there. Go put it out there. Disclaimer out there. Go ahead and put the disclaimer yes. about it. And then, yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Yeah. So these B12 shots been around forever, right? Forever. That predated me in medicine. We'll probably be here after people swear by them, right? But again, statistically, to Dr. Cola's point, has not been shown to be associated with more weight loss. Now, I do want to say if you have diabetes and you're taking metformin, metformin is associated with B12 yes. deficiency. deficiency. And so it is important to be on a B complex. And even with the GLP-1 a lot of times for the nausea that's associated with it as well, I'll put people on a B complex as well to kind of help with that and mitigate those symptoms. So, and, and, and also if you're past the age of 50, you're more at risk for B12 deficiency as well. So a B complex may be helpful and can help with weight loss um, in that context because you are deficient. So just to be clear, there's a few ones and someone in here had a question about my A1C is not going down, but my, you know, my blood sugar is normal. I would screen, I, I, if it were me, I would screen for iron deficiency anemia. I would make sure that your iron levels are up because that can give you a falsely high um, A1C. A1C has to do with the turnover of red blood cells. The normal life cycle of a red blood cell is checking the sugar that's attached to your red blood cell. And so it, and it takes 90 days for a red blood cell to die. So your A1C is a three month marker of how long your sugar or the, glyc the glycosylated sugar is attached to that red blood cell. So anything that causes your red blood cell to um, live longer than that is going to give you a false falsely elevated A1C. And to the point Dr. Coleman talked earlier about kidney disease, that can sometimes cause you to have a falsely low A1C because you're losing those red blood cells too quickly. So I would just make sure that you are go in and get a thorough uh, um, assessment and that they're checking for B12 deficiency, checking for iron deficiency, checking for all these things that might be giving you a falsely high A1C in that case. Can I just say something real quick about, so about the A1C? Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> go ahead, Mr. It's Dr. Griggs. No, no, you got no, us no. all excited. <laughs> you got to jump in with these women on this. I know. Stay with, stay with the A1C. And I, and I'll, if you stay with the A1C, I just, just want to get a quick, quick point. Yeah. No, if you, I don't want you to lose your thought about A1C. Oh, I just real quick. So when you, when I, if a patient tells me that their blood sugar is 120, but their A1C is still high, what I need to explain to them is, is that A1C is a combination of all your highs and all your lows over a three to four month period, which is the lifespan of that red blood cell that we just mentioned. So I just need you to know that when you wake up in the morning, your blood sugar needs to be between 90 and 130. And in order for you to get that A1C down there in the 7.0, 6.8, 6.9, you need to be closer to the 90 than you do to the 130. So even though 120 seems to you to be good, if your A1C is, is not down there in them sevens and below seven, then that means that you're eating something during the day 
that's spiking your blood sugar. So that's why I tell people when they come to first come to my program, we're going to do two weeks worth of, of, of testing. We're going to test you in the morning and then we're going to test you, right, you know, after your biggest meal and whatever that meal is during the day. And then we're going to see what really is going on with your blood sugar. Dr. Greg, the, the quick point I wanted to make is that if you're going to use herbs, if you're going to do any of the vitamin supplements, vitamin supplements are not FDA approved. Um, there's there's no regulating entity that will regulate the amount of the supplement that's in it. So you want to make sure you're dealing with two your professionals, your professionals uh, in, in medicine uh, from the doctor's side and from the pharmacy side to get recommendations on what could be consistent that you're putting in your body. Most importantly, you want to work with a healthcare provider, as you can see everything can be be measured so you can understand how to be the expert on you and not really harm yourself or waste your time absolutely we, we can we we could go on for a whole another hour with this one and and thank everybody in the comments y'all have been fantastic at just feeding and so we appreciate all that we're gonna have to run this back i, I know we're gonna have to do this again uh, with the same dream team that we got right here because i i knew y'all were good but y'all were fantastic tonight um <laughs> I will I will close with this as we're we're over our hour. I will close with this. There there are four things that you have. You have control over everything that happens in your health. You have the most control over that, and it starts with everything that you put in your mouth, right? And so that's that's number one. Uh, so what you eat, and again, give yourself some grace. If you have a bad day, I had a bad day the other day. I had chicken wings. I gotta let that. I gotta I give myself some grace on that day. And I started getting super new. So we don't scrap the whole diet plan or the whole changing of the diet because we had a bad day. We just say, recognize, acknowledge it, let it go, move on to today. That's number one, movement. So somebody asked about how do we start exercising? You start by just moving, right? It's not about going to a gym and doing something that's really a, buying a tape and doing all this other stuff. It's moving. Is it back on your floor? It's walking in your neighborhood. It is dancing, things that you like to do. Get that heart rate up in some way moving, right? We got we got to control that stinking thinking, right? So we're going to talk about that stinking thinking because that controls cortisol levels, that stress levels in your body. And, and as Dr. Bola talked about, uh, we're complex with all those chemicals. When we start having stress in our lives, we start getting too much stress and we start thinking, then our body starts getting out of whack and we start holding on to the things that we shouldn't be holding on to. So we've got to control our stress levels and whether that's meditation, you can control the exercise where you get that, that feel good at home, releasing your body after you have a good exercise, all of that stuff happens, controls your stress. And then finally, as Dr. Griggs said earlier, sleep. So we're going to eat, we're going to move, we're going to think better and we're going to sleep. Those four things, if we can control those things, we can have a better chance of losing the weight that we're trying to lose. A small amount of weight loss. We don't have to, I know we all want to lose 30, 40, 50 pounds. That's great. But a small amount of weight loss, five to 10 pounds, can have a significant impact on improving your overall health. You might not see it in the mirror, but your body will feel it and that will encourage you. So please, please, please take this, take what we we're saying tonight. Make those incremental changes. Make the small changes. I know we like to make dramatic changes in our life. Oh, everything. New Year's Eve, we're gonna we're gonna change our whole world. No, make the changes. Make incremental changes that you can sustain and then add something once you've got that habit formed. Okay. Incremental changes will be the best that you can best way to lose weight and to keep it off. So that's all we have for this evening. So I would say, hey, Friday, you gotta catch. Dr. Sylvia, 1 p.m. right here on blackdoctor.org. Her show is called Embrace You, Hot Topics and Weight Loss. So we're going to keep this momentum moving forward. We're going to, Dr. Griggs, we're going to be talking about heart health this month. February is Heart Health Month. And we know that is associated with diabetes and hypertension and all this other stuff. Number one killer of black men. So we're going to have to get our heart right. And so I know we're talking about Valentine's Day, but we're talking about the heart that's pumping that blood in your body. So we're going to, we're going to be getting that done. And then Dr. Coleman, Go to Step Up 9 if you've got diabetes. Go to Healing Our Village. Reach out to Dr. Coleman. Get her app. As you can see, she's fantastic. And she, you know, I only thought Tide was what I washed my clothes with, but the Tide apparently is something that um, that you got to use in terms of your medication. So there's a whole new classification for Tide. All right? <laughs> so, oh, my God. That, <laughs> I just I got it. I was like, what is he? Please. <laughs> 
Listen, man, I can't believe you just did that. I can't believe you did that. That was a that was a tired joke. That joke show was tired. <laughs> no, please, please do not misinterpret what Mr. D just said. Do not use tied for diabetes. Please do not use tied for diabetes. That is not what we're talking about on this show. Oh my goodness. I'm sorry. I got my dad jokes. I got my dad jokes. Thank you, Data. Thank you, Data. I got Data. I got somebody laughing at my dad joke. It's my dad joke. I'm sorry. I'm a father. I, I got to my dad joke. Lord, they're going to quote us. That's going to go wow. viral. The black doctor is saying, use Tide. Wow. Please. Do not please. take the no. detergent. Do, do not. not. Use no no Tide challenge. Watch your clothes either. and Tide okay. will not cause you to lose weight. No. No, no Tide challenge no. here. Please, please, please. Yes. Oh. Have a little levity. That's another thing. Laughter is good for your body too. So, like, so, so laugh. Laugh is good for your body too. Have some levity. Approach it. It's not a heavy thing. There is a process, but I promise you, with the experts here, talk to your 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 medical provider. Talk to whomever. You, it, you can do it, right? Give yourself some grace. You can do it, and there's no shame. So, with that, we're gonna pass the plate. Uh, the doors of the church are now open. And we'll see y'all next time. Bye, y'all. Be sure to connect. Bye, y'all. All right. Bye-bye. Don't eat that detergent.